All right. What's up, Stokers of Stoke Nation? This is Chad Kroger coming in with the Going Deep with Chad and JT podcast. Guys, before we begin, I want to remind you once again that we are brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping our trims pubed, for looking after our hogs, for making sure that we're looking fresh and clean because in these times more than ever, you need to be proactive. Yeah. I think that makes sense. So you used Manscaped, the fresh nose trimmer, fresh lawnmower 3.0 with code GODEEPWW for 20% off at manscaped.com. And I'm here with my compadre, Jean Thomas. What up? What up, Chad? Boom clap, stokers. Boom clap. And we're here with author, uh, rocket scientist. Uh, what, what are some other? You teach law, correct? You, you I teach do. law now, correct? Okay, Yeah, cool. that's right. Law professor, uh, Ozan Veral. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're pumped to have you on. We just read your new book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist. I'll put it in the frame. It's an excellent book. So, And it's such a fun read. Yeah, we're, we're, we're so pumped to talk to you. Likewise. Uh, well, how do you think, like, how, how are lawyers different to hang out with than rocket scientists? <laughs> far less interesting oh yeah. really <laughs> i think so i mean you know lawyers uh look i love them i mean i teach law students but i think the subjects tend to center around the the same things whereas rocket scientists are working on cooler stuff uh yeah. they're more cutting edge than than lawyers i mean there's just so many things that can happen uh when you go to light a rocket and only one of them is good as uh well, this is one of the SpaceX guys' quotes, but but I love that. I mean, there's just so many things that, so many um, uncertain scenarios that it's just more fun to talk to them, to rocket scientists. Well, why why'd you switch? For a number of reasons. One, I didn't love the substance of the classes I was taking. Like rocket science is in, is supposed to be interesting, but honestly, the instruction in college I thought sort of sucked the life and soul out of. Mm-hmm what is inherently an interesting subject, which is, I think, a testament to the education system in general, which we can go into some depth, depth about, but it was too much theory for me. Like, I've always been more practically oriented, and the classes were so theoretical and so disconnected mm-hmm. from practical realities. I mean, I was working on this Mars mission at the time, which was really cool, because that was very practical, right? You're building a rover that's going to go to Mars, and um, and designing operation scenarios and whatnot, helping pick landing sites. But the classes, it's like, you know, yeah, we can reprove E equals MC squared, but how is that moving the needle? Um, so that's why I started looking elsewhere. And I, my senior year of college, I took a class that was taught by a Cornell law professor. And he taught the class only for undergrads. And it was like a breath of fresh air. He taught real, we use like real law cases and he used a Socratic method, the question and answer method. Um, And I remember thinking like sitting in the class and the first case we read was about this like nose job that was gone wrong uh, and the patient was suing the doctor and the question was damages. Um, And I was like, oh, like as like, as you know, as like, I don't know, irrelevant as that might sound, I was like, man, this is a real dispute between two real people. Uh, I can sink my teeth into this in a way that theoretical physics, I really couldn't. Um, and I would have had to go get a PhD in, in astrophysics. And frankly, like there were classmates who were much better than me at the substance of it. And so mm. I ended up doing a pivot and, and go to law and becoming a law professor. That's so cool. Yeah, what, what, what do you think are the what kind of changes do you think could be made in the education system to get people more excited about science and more involved? Yeah. So, I mean, children are naturally curious and Mm -hmm. naturally self-driven. And then we rob them of that curiosity, of that natural self-drive by basically um, feeding them answers on subjects that they don't care about. You know, authority figure steps up to the front of the classroom and then just like reveals Newton's laws as if they arrived by some like divine visitation. And and then the students memorize the laws, memorize the formulas, and then they like plug them into a problem and that spits out the right answer on the exam. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, the mentality is so 
outdated for a number of reasons because it gives one the misleading impression that like life is a series of right answers and as long as you know the right answers you'll get far in life which is not true um mm -hmm. and it also gives the perception of like certainty that you know newton sort of came up with these laws you don't see the messy reality like the the the, the science textbooks reveal the principles but not the the messy reality the the years that newton spent tweaking, mm -hmm. revising these laws. Um, and you definitely don't learn about Newton's experiments in alchemy when he was trying to convert lead into gold and failed spectacularly. Um, and so, so I think it begins by asking what is school for? And I don't think the answer is it's for students to memorize a bunch of answers. Um, mm -hmm. That may have worked well in the industrial age when you were training people to work at a, you know, on an assembly line and they had to follow instructions. But it doesn't work in the knowledge age that, that we're in, the information age that we're in. So I think school should be more about learning to ask the right questions, honestly, which is, mm -hmm. I think, far more important skill and far more rare in today's world. Uh, answers are cheap. Like By the time that Siri or Alexa or Google can spit out an answer, the world has moved on. Mm. But the students who can identify problems, good problems to solve, ask good questions, reframe problems, that's the other um, problem with like traditional science education and math education is you get these problems from the teacher, but there is no way of redefining them. First of all, students are not finding their own problems. They're handed the mm. problem. And then there is no way to change the problem. Mm. And that's wildly disconnected from reality. Like in the real world, people have to go out and find problems themselves. And then they have to change the definition of the problem, reframe the problem so they can generate better answers. Uh, mm -hmm. And we don't teach any of that in school. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, was, I was talking about this with JT the other day about how, like in my 20s, it, it, when, I, when, when I finished college, when I was out on my own, it sort of uh, re-energized my curiosity for learning. Yeah. yeah, once I was out of school, I was like, I love learning. <laughs> <laughs> uh which because i i feel like school they they sort of treat it like a burden you know it's like it's like oh you gotta read mark twain that sucks and it's like it, you got you got you gotta do some you gotta go to lab or do science and it's the the the, the approach is so um like it's it, like it's something you have to like overcome as opposed to like engaging your curiosity totally so education in many ways actually ends up getting in the way of learning um, yeah. and stifling people's natural curiosity because, and honestly, it's human nature too. Like anytime someone forces you to, to do something, mm. you got to resent it. Even if yeah. you might like on your own, go out and seek a, a Mark Twain book. The moment the teacher forces you to read something, you might turn it away. Um, yeah. And so I think there's a lot more room here to allow for that natural curiosity to come about, but we don't do that. Yeah. It's all about standardized tests and, and teaching to the test and, and grading and grading is, I mean, that's one of the other downsides of education is completely gets in the way of learning. Um, mm -hmm. Even as a law professor, it's like students are so focused on the grades that it just, you know, everything is about, is this going to be on the exam? Uh, and yeah. I don't blame them because that's where the incentives are. Um, yeah but it totally gets in the way of learning. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it seems like education is always kind of looking backwards too. Like I went yeah. to film school and they're teaching you about like film noir stuff from the forties, but that kind of structure is like obsolete. Now everybody's writing for TV, but then even if they would have taught us contemporary TV, it's like the way you would write for a Netflix show is different than how you would write for like an HBO show. Cause of the way people consume it. So I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if they have enough time to like catch up to, I don't know, making it more contemporary for the, the students. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the status quo bias is so strong in educational institutions. Um, as you said, it's always about um, looking back to what was done in the past. And it's not it's not just the substance. It's also like the administrative policies. Um, I remember it was like my first week of teaching and I walked into the faculty lounge and we teach this class. It's called criminal procedure. It's a pretty complicated class. We teach it at, like to beginning first year students. And normally it's an upper level class. So I was curious why we were teaching it in the first year. And I walked into the faculty lounge and one of my senior colleagues was reading the paper. And I said, hey, why do we teach criminal procedure in the first year? And he, uh, he like lowered the newspaper and said, we've always done it that way. And then went back mm. to reading it. <laughs> and you know, uh, 
and I didn't, I didn't have tenure yet, so I kept my mouth <laughs> shut and didn't say anything. But, but I mean that I think that mindset is 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 very much exemplified across educational institutions. It's like you know, and it's true for businesses as well, right? That that's the status quo bias is also strong there. But we've always done it this way. I don't know. It strikes me as a really lousy reason to keep doing something. I mean, there might be a perfectly valid educational reason for teaching that class to be getting law, law students, but we've always done it that way is not, is not a good reason. Totally. Nice. Uh, how did you, how did you feel when you saw the Falcon nine, uh, launch? Oh God. Goosebumps. I, yeah. you know, I just, it was, I, you know, so I write a lot about SpaceX in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And I've just been, I mean, I've been an admirer of the, of the organization for a long time. Um, and so just to give it some context to the launch. So there have only been three major governments that have been able to put people into space, right? The mm -hmm. U.S., China, and Russia. That's it. Um, no other major government has done it. Uh, no other company has done it. So SpaceX became the first private company to put people into space, which is astonishing. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, right? I mean, they beat not only so many other powerful governments, but also traditional aerospace companies like Boeing to the punch. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an amazing story. And and if you look at like the beginnings of SpaceX too, um, it was not a glamorous start. The first three Falcon 1, Falcon 1 launches were just spectacular failures. Um, mm -hmm. The company was on the verge of going under at the end of 2008. Like Elon Musk was borrowing money from friends to pay rent. Um, mm -hmm. He had just gotten divorced and all of these horrible things were going on and 2008 was a bad year to begin with. So yeah. seeing that and so seeing where they came from, uh, which is nothing and these three failures and then fast forward to 2020 and SpaceX becomes the first private company to put people into space. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so watching that was breathtaking. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I watch a rocket launch, but like that one in particular, uh, having studied the company for so long and having written about it had special meaning to me. Uh, so it was awesome to see a lift off and safely deliver the two astronauts to the International Space Station. Yeah, it's a, uh, there's something about space exploration, because I, I think people always debate, like, is it worth the, the, the money or, or whatever, but there, there's something that it does to, to humanity, I think, just seeing, yeah. that, seeing us explore and, and 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 sort of reach these new heights i think you know the the most powerful and universal human emotion is awe being mm. in awe of something uh, yeah. and i think space does that more than anything else uh, yeah. at least for me it's just incredible um just thinking about the stars in general but also like seeing us explore these new heights um you know i i uh i opened the book by telling the story of John F. Kennedy step up to the podium at Rice University Stadium in September 1962 and promising to land a man on the moon and return him safely to the earth before the decade is out. And, you know, that, that promise, of course, turned out to be true. That pledge was, um, the mission was accomplished. But what people don't know is how unlikely that was in September, mm -hmm. September 1962 when he made that pledge. A lot of the people in the audience thought he was out of his mind. Uh, NASA officials thought he was crazy because so much of what would be required to put a man on the moon which had just hadn't been done yet. Like no American astronaut had worked outside of a spacecraft. Um, NASA didn't know if the lunar surface was solid enough to support a lander or like mm -hmm. if you landed something, it would just, it might just cave through. They just didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't know if the communication system would work on the moon. Kennedy said some of the metals required to build the rockets hadn't even been invented. Uh, you know, we yeah. sort of like jumped into the cosmic void and yeah. hoped that we'd grow wings on the way up. And, and yeah. we did um, in less than seven years. And so so I think that I and mean, that is such an inspiring story. And it's particularly inspiring if you put it in the context of like human uh, human flight in general. Mm -hmm. So thinking back to Wright brothers, uh, when when they took their first flight, a child who was six years old. And the first flight was like 10 seconds long and la moved for like 100 feet maybe. Mm -hmm. A child who was six years old when the Wright brothers took their first flight would be 72 when flight became powerful enough to put a man on the moon. Uh, That's crazy. I mean, it's just astonishing, right? Like 66 yeah. years from Wright brothers to Neil Armstrong's giant leap for mankind. Um, yeah. 
it's just it's so i think that is inspiring on so many levels and it generates that universal emotion awe and when like neil and buzz walked on the lunar surface when you you know, when when you watch the interviews of people around the world who had watched the lunar landing, everybody was saying, we landed on the moon. It wasn't the United States landed on the moon. It was like humanity yeah. achieved this. So it's a very unifying emotion, which is, you know, one of the things I love about it. Totally. Yeah, yeah it sort of it sort of goes into the, the section of the book where you talk about moonshots or having these big yeah. dreams, uh, which, I, which I thought was so great. It's just sort of making this declaration that you will do something and then um like elon and 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 nasa so yeah it's cool stuff how, how uh so you worked on some mars exploration mm -hmm. projects uh, do you want to maybe uh sort of talk about that a little bit about what sure yeah yeah, yeah happy to do it. it yeah so um i worked on the what was later called the 2003 Mars Exploration Rovers mission, which sent two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, to Mars in 2003. Um, and I did everything from like plan operation scenarios as to what was going to happen when the rovers landed on Mars. I helped pick landing sites. I my senior thesis in college was actually writing code for snapping photos of the of the Martian surface. And so oh, cool. that was that was a, just a really really cool project to to work on for so many reasons, because when I first started, so I started in 1999, 1999 was a terrible year for Mars exploration. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two really high profile accidents. So uh, two missions failed. Uh, one was called the Mars Climate Orbiter and the other is the Mars Polar Lander. And Mars Climate Orbiter famously failed. Uh, it was supposed to be an orbiter around Mars. So it wasn't gonna land on Mars. Um, mm -hmm. And it was supposed to enter into orbit at like, I think, uh, 127 kilometers above the surface. Instead, it ended up being 57. And so it either burned up in the atmosphere or skidded across it and get, didn't get into orbit. Um, but what happened was, so Lockheed Martin, which programmed a key trajectory software, was using the inch pound system. And then the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA that was actually operating the orbiter was using the the metric system. Uh, and they didn't use units of measurement. And mm. so the numbers were completely off by a factor mm. of four. Uh, oh yeah. And so the whole, the, it, it ended up because of that entering into Mars at an altitude, altitude of uh, like half of what it should have been. And it burned up um, mm. or, or again, or skidded across the atmosphere. Which is crazy when you yeah. think about it, right? It's like, how does that happen? Um, you know, I, I remember my high school physics class, our teacher would give us zero points if you got the right answer, but you didn't include units of measurement. Uh, mm. And it always like annoyed the hell out of me. I just had a, I don't know, relaxed, la lazy approach to units of measurement. So if you put like 120 instead of 120 meters, you get zero points. Mm. And then you fast forward to like, what happened with the Mars Climate Orbiter is like, oh, well, these rocket scientists would have failed my uh, high school physics <laughs> class, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was one, like, high-profile crash. And then the Mars Polar Lander that year, which was supposed to land on the polar regions of Mars, region of Mars, also crashed. Uh, and then our mission was going to be next in line, and we were going to use the exact same landing mechanism that the mm -hmm. Mars Polar Lander was supposed to use. And so our mission got put on hold. And so there was just so much, so many early failures. We had to come up with an entirely new way of, of landing on Mars um, because the landing system didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. And then we were initially supposed to send only one rover. Um, and then it ended up being two rovers because the administrator of NASA just asked this question that none of us had thought about asking before. Like the status quo, which we talked about how powerful it is, NASA would send one rover to Mars every two years mm -hmm. and, and hope that nothing bad happens along the way. Uh, but so many things can go wrong when you're sending yeah. a delicate robot 40 million miles through outer space. And so, yeah. yeah, I remember the day when my boss walked into my office and said, I just got off the phone with the administrator of NASA and he asked, like, what if we sent two rovers instead of one? Mm. In hindsight, it makes so much sense, like because you're hedging your bets and mm -hmm. uh, double the rovers means double the science. We sent them to two very different regions of Mars. 
Um, and with economies of scale, when you're building two of the same thing, the second thing ends up costing a lot less than the first. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm so glad we did because both of them landed safely. Their names are Spirit and Opportunity and Spirit lasted for six years. And by the way, these were built to last for 90 days. Yeah. Um, so last, that one lasted for six years and then Opportunity kept roving for 14 years into a 90 day mission, which is incredible. Yeah. How long do you think till humans get to Mars? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I'm hoping it's within my lifetime. Um, yeah. And and I think, you know, SpaceX is getting there gradually. Uh, that's the their moonshot. Um, and they're working backward from that in terms of developing the technology that will be required to get there. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hoping it's within our lifetime, but I, I tend not to like forecasts or predictions just because they end up being wrong like 99% right. of the time, you know, yeah. um, which which is like I was giving a keynote earlier today and um, and the questions were always a lot of the questions were, what do you think is going to happen in 2021? Like which of the changes that we're seeing in the world right now will have become permanent? And And my answer always is, I don't know. Um, I just, and no one knows anything, you know, um, there's a quote I love from Lao Tzu. I think he says, those who predict or those who forecast don't know. And those who Mm. know don't forecast or don't predict Mm. because they just end up being wrong. And then we're only seeing the winners too. Like whatever an expert is right, it makes the news. But when someone is not right, it doesn't make the news. And no one says like, oh, Dr. Stu, you know, you've got only a, 10% 10% batting average, maybe you should sit this one out. Um, yeah. no, the same people like keep appearing and keep making these confident declarations. And there's a lot of, they provide certainty, right? Like we're in this messy reality now. No one knows what's going to happen next. But when, if an expert can get on TV and say, this is what I think is going to happen in January, people latch onto it because it provides them some, some certainty in this messy reality we're in. It's just the the sense of certainty ends up being super misleading because in most cases it's false. Right. So so, if yeah. you were in charge of like uh, allocating like science spending, where mm-hmm. would you put like the biggest share of the pie right now? That's a really good question. Um, let me think about that for a moment. Hmm. You know, uh, I would pull a lot of it and I'm going to speak in generalities here, but in terms of like coming up with strategies for prevention as opposed to cure Uh, right now, when it comes to health, at least there's so much focus on curing things after they happen, but not preventing them. Like our entire healthcare system is, is based on that model basically where we treat people after they get sick as opposed to trying to prevent them from getting sick in the first place. So I think there's a lot of uh, value to spending money on on research, on prevention, uh, not just research, but actually execution of prevention. Um, so that's that's one realm, I think, because, you know, there are so many preventable diseases um, that with an early intervention would just never come about, but we wait until it's too late. Uh, and then that ends up being just an enormous, enormous burden on the on the healthcare system. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I think space certainly. Although you know, now the private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are taking the lead on that. Uh, so if we're talking about like allocation of government spending, you know, I don't think that that uh, needs to be. I mean, it certainly should be there because NASA still has to be in the game because um, it. NASA has a project, for example, of, of, of landing on moon, on the moon. I think it's, I don't remember the timeline. It's called Artemis. Um, so space flight, definitely. Uh, let's see what else is top of mind for me. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that could use, and, and so these are very personal, but but they're top of mind. Uh, one of the things that I'm observing with the pandemic is is a rise in emotional and mental health problems. Um, mm. We're not meant to live like this, right? We're not meant to look at Zoom screens all day. Um, and the isolation is 
I think exacerbating many people's emotional and health issues. Um, and so I would invest a lot of funding in, in the mental health and emotional health area because it takes a huge toll. And I think this is one of the right now unforeseen or unnoticed consequences of the, of the quarantine is the, the rise in uh, emotional and mental problems that I think is going to generate consequences in the long term. And one area within the within mental health that I, I wish the government invested more money would be research on psychedelics and the promise of psychedelics in, mm. in treating like post traumatic stress disorder. Um, and there, I mean, there are already FDA trials underway uh, for MDMA and using MDMA for for treating uh, post traumatic stress disorder, and they've been enormously successful so far, but they need money to be able to move forward. And there's so much stigma attached to psychedelics because of their, you know, association with the counterculture. The connotation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, but they hold so much promise just based on the research that was done in the 1960s. And then some of the emerging research right now as well, that's happening. Um, and I think they have the promise. I mean, they're, they can be certainly dangerous as well, but when done correctly, they have the promise to, to um to remedy some of the mental health problems that that we're seeing in the world right now so i would definitely put some money toward that too yeah it's like when you read about timothy leary and ram Dass doing their experiments at harvard it seems so willy-nilly like they're just yeah. having big parties and they're like hitting on each other's spouses and stuff like that and you're like all right well this these guys are obviously smart but it doesn't seem like they're following a scientific playbook but i mean i love psychedelics like shrooms have been hugely um how would I say it? Like they've taught me a lot about myself and actually made me feel better about my, like when I first did it, I remember I was like, Oh, I'm going to find out I'm a dark person. And then I took it and I was like, no, I'm a happy ape, which is kind of like that Richard Feynman quote that he says confused ape, but I felt yeah. like a happy ape. And I started running on all fours and I was like, Oh, this is, <laughs> not, a, this is not a bad way to, have you, have you, have you experimented with psychedelics before yourself? Uh, I have. Yes. Uh, I actually haven't talked about it publicly before, but I have. Um, and, and the setting is so important, by the way. I mean, you know, when I did psychedelics, it was done in a therapeutic setting and it really just made a world of difference. Uh, and I'm so glad I didn't do it in like a recreational setting first. Uh, that was really important to me. And, uh, and there, in, in so many sessions leading up to the actual journey too, where I thought were invaluable in terms of having the right mindset going in and like identifying your intentions and what you want to get out of the session and then the integration sessions that happen afterwards. Um, mm. And so doing it in a controlled setting, again, these are like just prefacing, these are dangerous substances, they're illegal in the United States, but when done correctly in the right set and setting, they have enormous potential um, to address issues like post-traumatic stress disorder. And then research also shows like alcoholism, uh, addiction, uh, you know, and so, so yeah, so I think that that is one area that that deserves a lot more funding. Um, and if you are so if you're listening to this, and if you are so inclined, I know maps is currently running a fundraising campaign to support their phase three, I think MDMA trials, um, that's mm -hmm. ongoing right now. So I would highly encourage you to go to their website and, and check that out. Um, because there's a lot of promise in them. Yeah, I, I saw um, I saw on Goop Lab on Netflix. Uh, what's your name? Uh, what's your name, JT? Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, yeah. Her, her show. Yeah, they did a controlled uh, shroom episode in like Jamaica or something. I was like, because I had a bad experience with it in high school. But that was I, I had unforeseen circumstances. Mainly, my brother coming home, and I didn't want him to find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought he was Bart Simpson. Um, but anyways, yeah, yeah, it looks it looks like it's so beneficial and just. Um, yeah, it can be. And again, just yeah. to like underscore, you know, when I did it, it was like two people in the room, a man and a woman to sort of represent the masculine, the feminine and they're holding space and they're trained. They've mm -hmm. done this before. And that made a world of difference for me because uh, you feel a lot safer. Um, yeah. And then they help. They don't interfere, but they help guide how it mm. progresses. And and so it just ends up being a very different experience than if you were doing it recreationally or just by right. yourself or with your friends or something. Totally. Yeah. yeah.
Uh, yeah, it was making me think with psychedelics how they can, you know, open your brain to like, you kind of close doors. If your brain's like a mansion, you know, we close certain rooms off. We don't go in there. Sure. Yep. You take psychedelics, you start opening rooms. You're like, oh, I didn't even know I could go in here. And it's, I was scared of this room. Now I know it's safe. And it feels like so much of like science and mathematical breakthroughs come from being able to think outside the box yeah. like that. And I, I, there was a writer I liked, David Foster Wallace, who said, most mathematicians have their breakthroughs like before they're 25. Like mm. almost no one has their breakthrough after that. Because I think, uh, to me, I, I interpret that to me, your brain kind of shuts down to new possibilities at a certain point. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about that. So what psychedelics do, and then specifically speaking about like psilocybin and LSD here, uh, what they do is one of the things they do is they quiet the default mode network in the brain. Uh, and the default mode network is like the central operator. All of the different regions of the brain talk to each other through the default mode network. Um, and then the default mode network also is responsible for that sense of self, ego, is where the default mode network lies. And so yeah. when you take psilocybin or LSD, and if you look at like the, the, the brain scans uh, of people who are on psilocybin or LSD, the default mode network shuts down. And all of these different regions of the brain that normally only operate with each other or talk to each other indirectly through the default mode network end up directly connecting with one another. Um, mm. So these, yeah, so that the sense of self quiets down and then um, and then all of these like new neural pathways get get activate, activated. Um, and it, as you said, was it J, JT? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, JT, like a lot of creative ideas come from cross pollination. So to be able to connect these like disparate ideas you have in your brain, uh, that's where that's how breakthroughs happen. Um, but we don't. There is so much obsession with specialization these days that a lot of people just end up doing one thing for the rest of their lives. And so they don't have the opportunity to be able to connect these different ideas and, and generate creative thought with them. So the example that popped to mind uh, is Charles Darwin. So when he came up with the um, you know, theory of evolution, origin of species, he was inspired by a number of things. He was inspired by a geology textbook he read and, a, and an economics textbook he read. And the geology textbook basically said, you know, the changes that we observe in the, uh, on Earth happen gradually over like thousands and hundreds of thousands of years through erosion, water and wind sort of chipping away at the Earth's surface. It's not one mega event, but it happens over time. And Darwin looked at that and said, huh, like I wonder if evolution might work the same way, where like these gradual changes are happening in species. It's not one, you know, change overnight. And then there was an economics textbook by, um, I think Thomas Malthus was, was his name. Anyway, um, like he Malthusian. wrote a, yeah, well, yeah, like, exactly. Yep. Like yeah. the world kills a bunch of us to keep the population small. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, his idea was like populations tend to outgrow resources, creating this competition for survival. Uh, and then Darwin looked at that. I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? So if there is a competition for survivor, which species survive? And the answer was to those that are, you know, best adapted to their the environment. Fittest. Yeah. Mm. And so, so he took these ideas from very different disciplines and then he combined them. Um, and, and so, and then by the way, there were a lot of people at the time who had read Charles Lyell's geology textbook. There are a lot of people who had read Thomas Malthus's economics textbook. There are a lot of people who had studied species but it was a rare person who read Lyell, who read Malthus, and who studied species and could actually make the connections between these, these three different fields, um, which is so important. I mean, all new ideas tend to be combinations of existing ideas from, from very different fields. Like I call that, uh, so I, just a little bit of backstory here. I learned English as a second language. I grew up in a family of no English speakers uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, and I started learning English when I was in middle school. Um, and so when I came to the U.S. at 17 by myself, I had learned textbook English. Textbook English meaning like, you know, the bus stop is around the corner and, and this and that, but people don't talk like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there was just a lot of idioms and expressions that didn't make sense to me. And I remember freshman year of college, I don't remember what we were talking about, but um, one of my friends was like, dude, that's like comparing apples and oranges. And I was like, all right, what's wrong with that? And he <laughs> said, he says, oh, it can't be done. 
you can't you can't compare apples and oranges i was like what do you mean you can't compare apples and oranges mm. they're both fruits they're both round <laughs> They both have yeah. like a slightly tangy taste. They both grow on trees. Like there are just so many similarities between apples and oranges, but we're, you know, we're sort of indoctrinated into this mode of thinking. We're like, no, you stick to your own discipline. You don't compare apples and oranges. Uh, but that's where, you know, a lot of original ideas come from. Uh, like Netflix is a good example of that. Reed Hastings was, he was pissed off because he had rented Apollo 13 and then misplaced it. Um, and uh, so then he got a bunch of late fees. And so he found the DVD, returned it, paid his late fees, and he was at the gym working out. Mm -hmm. And and he realized that with the gym, like he could work out as much or as little as he wants, and he still pays 40 bucks a month. Um, and he's like, huh, why don't we do that with videos? Mm -hmm. Like, why do, we, why do we need brick and mortar stores? And why do we need late fees? Why don't we create a model where you rent as many DVDs as you want, as many movies as you want? and pay the same fixed price. And that was a seed for, for Netflix. I mean, it looks so obvious in hindsight, uh, but it wasn't obvious at the time. And it's like the people who can make these connections between very different fields tend to be the, tend to be the original thinkers. Yeah, I almost wonder if that can be taught because it almost feels like the yeah. ability to like take concepts and use them across different disciplines might just be like, I don't know, an, uh, an inherent ability, but but I guess if you're talking about like with reworking education, it could be something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think like the educational, if, if we can change the education system and if we can change parenting um, <laughs> as well, like, you know, and encourage parents to allow their children to pursue their curiosity, um, I think that would go a long way. And, and yeah, and so get rid of this obsessive focus on specialization. And actually, because to be able to make these connections, to be able to connect the dots, you have to collect them first hmm. and collection happens when you are curious about something and curious about a number of different things and then you pursue them and children do this naturally like children don't specialize in anything like they're they have different interests and they go after them um and then the other thing that needs to be done if we're like trying to train this way of thinking is is one allowing the the connection of the dots and then uh, the collection of the dots and then the connecting requires a lot of silence, actually. Um, silence meaning like this is why great ideas come to people in the shower mm -hmm. where you are stepping away from distractions and you're in that environment. Where you're just alone with your thoughts and subconscious, your subconscious then has the room to be able to make these connections between the dots that you you collected. But most of us don't make room for that, right? Like we're moving from one email to the next, one notification to the next, one meeting to the next without pausing and reflecting and like giving ourselves time to to just think. Uh, and... Yeah, my stimuli center is like a melted battery right now. I just <laughs> hammer that thing nonstop. Yeah, and, and it's amazing what you can what can happen when you like can build an airplane mode of sorts into your day where you're just like, and you can start small and just sit with your thoughts for 15 minutes. It's gonna be really hard to begin with. There was actually a research study that I quote in the book where they had like college students, they took away their phones and all of their devices. And the college students had the option of either sitting quietly with their thoughts or administering electric shocks to themselves. <laughs> and, a, and like a ridiculous percentage, I don't remember, especially among men, I think like, don't quote me on this, but it was around like 60 or 70% of the male participants shocked themselves. Mm -hmm. And for, for women, it was like in the 20s or 30s. Uh, wow. But it's, you know, it's really hard for people to just sit still and think and get bored. Um, and because you think, I think like boredom is just sort of like something to be avoided, that it's painful. Um, like for me, it brings up memories of getting yelled at by my teachers for daydreaming. Um, but your brain, when it's at when it's not guys i'm interrupting this podcast so you, i'm interrupting this podcast let you know once again that we are brought to you by manscape manscape thank you so much for keeping our trims pubed for looking after our hogs for making sure that our d-o-n-g dongs are looking fresh and clean because when you step out into the world and you got a messy dink you know when your crank is looking just like a freaking, you know, unkempt baseball field. Shout out to Aaron Stodgeball team, softball team. 
then you know you're doing something wrong. But that's where Manscaped comes in, okay? Because, fellas, are you prepared to unwail your summer bod? Are you? Because Manscaped is here to ensure your post Q team body is ready for the wild. Do not be the guy at the beach with a bear rug on your chest. And if you grew some quarantine man tits, the least you can do is make sure they're hairless. Uh, I'm in escaped over the weekend and uh, I felt great, you know? Yeah. Felt great. Manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your full body grooming game. They have forever changed the grooming game with their Perfect Package 3.0. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your manscaping routine. This is the best trimmer on the market for those of you in need of a chest shave. The third generation trimmer features skin safe technology, no accidents on your dong. Uh, you can adjust it. You can get the crop cleanser, keep your hair and skin healthy. It's all in one formula. So it's good for your chest hair. It's good for your skin. You get the perfect package. You got anti-chafing ball deodorant. You got moisturizer, um, the crop reviver. It's like a testy toner. It gives you a nice pep in your set. You know, just put some country club toner on your nuts. Uh, subscribe to the perfect package. Get a new blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivery to your door every three months. And for a limited time, subscribers get two free gifts. The Shed Travel Bag, $39 value add, and the patented high-performance reduced chafing Manscaped boxer briefs. Um, JT, you been manscaping? I have not. Well, tidy up that dink. Copy that. Uh, Aaron, Captain. Next Aaron, time you see me. Fresh tight, dink. Tight dink. <laughs> tight dink. Oh, dude, yeah. Aaron, how's your crank looking these days? It's it's a pretty full, pretty full uh, thatch of bush right now, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting in there with my lawnmower. Nice. Dude, I'm, I'm picturing fresh. it right now. I'm sure you are. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks. And guess what, Aaron? You got a nice bush. Appreciate it. Yeah. When I see your bush, I hear the band bush in my head. Glycerin. You know that when they did that epic outdoor concert where it was raining for MTV? Uh That's what I see in here when I see your bush. I I hope my bush is a better live band. (laughs) Oh, dude. (laughs) They're good now. Yeah. At first, they were really terrible. I never saw them live. The second album came with uh, like a, a a selection of live tracks and concert footage, and it was real bad. Oh damn! Yeah, like it's all your favorite songs. That, the first one. Rosdale's a pretty hot guy, so it's tough for me to say that. Yeah. And dudes, with that. Uh, Use code GoDeepWW at Manscaped.com. Get 20% off free shipping with code GoDeepWW at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off free shipping. Manscaped.com. Use code GoDeepWW. Trim your chesticles with your besticles and take care of your knob. The I do is I go into the sauna pretty much every day for 20 minutes with just like a notepad and a Mm -hmm. pencil and just sit there. Uh, and and it's stifling and it's solitary but like some of the best ideas that have come to me come to me in that environment yeah do, do you think uh, like should you um like is walking one way to do it yeah, like, yeah, totally. walk or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or like skateboarding even like longboard skateboarding totally or, walking surfing like yeah exercising uh there's so many examples of scientists like literally walking themselves into the answer of a problem right. that they were thinking about right um yeah. einstein einstein and his violin like he would play his violin when he was stuck and then in the middle of like playing a song he'd be like oh i got it and then he'd <laughs> move in and like so yeah. i don't know it's um it's i mean i struggle with it too look it's, it's like distractions are everywhere um mm-hmm. and so i try to control my environment and like put my phone away and and do things like that because I know if my phone is within reach, I'm going to take a look. Right. It's, it's just human nature. So, but if I put it on airplane mode and in the kitchen, I'm less likely to even just putting that little bit of separation there goes a long way. Yeah. I, I, found, I have to physically leave it 
like in my apartment and just go. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll exactly. seek it out. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and also Steve Martin, who who you talk about in the book, he, he yeah, I watched his uh, his master class and he talked about how to get material. And he's like, you just got to study different topics like history, science, and that's where you'll get your ideas. It's not from like sitting down and just trying to force it out. It's like going back to that sort of diversity and thought. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. And also, yeah. And also, it, I, I love the story of him sort of when you talk about like redefining first principles, mm-hmm. how he, he thought about stand up and sort of shifted it on his head to, to um, you know, so he wasn't doing the traditional structure. And it's uh, that was always really inspiring for, for me personally, just in my life uh, <laughs> or career what, with what we're in. So. That's awesome. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I love that story too. I mean, he, you yeah. know, for those who are listening who don't know it, it's like when he first started doing comedy, stand-up comedy, there was a standard playbook formula, which was like yeah. all jokes had to have a punchline. Uh, yeah. And Steve Martin was like, what if I did the reverse? What if like there was no punchline? What if I right. built tension and never released it? Uh, and and people were like, you're out of your mind. Uh, I think one newspaper called him like the most serious booking error in, in LA <laughs> yeah. history. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the most serious booking errors quickly became the most profitable one because he yeah. was he was standing out from the crowd uh, and he wasn't following the standard playbook that, that everybody else is following. Um, I call it the... <laughs> In the book, I call it the George Costanza approach. Uh, yeah, there's, there's it's one of my favorite of, episodes. Yeah, yeah, there's an episode of Seinfeld where he like just yeah. does the opposite of <laughs> yeah. what he's done before. Like he walks up to this gorgeous woman at a diner and he says, uh, I'm unemployed and I live at home with my parents <laughs> yeah. and ends up like getting a date with her. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot to be said about that because the, the, the long hanging fruit has been picked already. You know, we're yeah. all in this race to the center uh, doing the same thing. And like, if you can think through like, what if I did the reverse? And even if you don't execute, just like the, the process of thinking through that question often forces you to, or forces you out of your current perspective and like makes you think about different ways of, of approaching the problem. Yeah. What if I did the opposite? And in those specific instances, like braving the humiliation of being new or different and then not letting the reaction to it define how you go forward exactly that's such an important part too man and it's so hard because whenever you buck conventional wisdom like the the people just laugh at you they're gonna Uh, chop you down yeah they're gonna chop you down exactly same thing happened to dick fosbury who uh who was an athlete um ended up revolutionizing the high jump but so when he first started doing high jump, he was in high school and he was performing at a junior high level. Uh, and at the time, all athletes were jumping face first parallel to the bar. Uh, right. They would, they would clear it. And the method just never worked for Fosbury. So he was like, what if I did the opposite? And so mm-hmm. in one of, and this was like on the bus ride to a track meet, going back to like getting moored and daydreaming, he was literally staring out a window. Um, and he's like, oh, the rules allow you to clear the bar any way you want, as long as you jump off one foot. And so he thought to himself, well, what if I jump backwards instead of forward? Um, and his, his coaches were like, drop it, you're out of your mind. Uh, one newspaper called him the world's laziest high jumper. Uh, <laughs> like the fans would literally laugh at him from the stands. Yeah. And then, you know, he proved his critics wrong. He won the gold medal and the 1968 Summer Olympics by doing the opposite of what everybody else was doing. And now like that's the standard method used in high jump events. So yeah, there's a lot of like, whenever you're straying from the herd, you get humiliated and you get laughed at. Um, and a lot of people give up. Hey, it's yeah. in the NBA. Rick Barry is the best free throw shooter of all time shooting underhand. Yeah. And other guys won't do it because they just don't want to look stupid. But they're like exactly. 40% free throw shooters. Yeah, exactly. Come on, Andre Drummond. Just yeah, <laughs> make yourself a little unique. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. When I read that in the book too about the high jump, I was like, it, I, I was like, wow, I can't even. I had no idea that it changed at a certain point. Like, and it's hard to imagine yeah. people jumping forward. Right. Like, <laughs> it just seems like, I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, just picturing that. Uh, and yeah, with with the sort of um, with the sort of Steve Martin example, like when we when we were in, we do stand up and when we started Louis CK was like the big 
guy everyone looked mm-hmm. up to, you know, and then we're just like, oh, you got to be sort of like this self-loathing kind of vulnerable guy. And that's sort of what I started doing. And people are like, what are you, like, you're like a surfer. And you're like, <laughs> you're like kind of good looking. And I was like, I was like, yeah, that's true. Like, and I'm not sad. <laughs> 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 so I sort of had like that. I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't equate it to a Steve Martin moment, but it was more of like that kind of like, oh yeah, well, what if I just go the opposite and sort of talk about what's really on my mind, which is like hmm. how much I love being tan. And that <laughs> seemed to, and that sort of, that worked. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's just an example. But yeah. It's, it's hard think, though, finding that like authentic self. So what, I mean, right. so what worked well for you, Chad, in like sort of giving up, you know, the the idea of following Louis C.K. and actually like staying true to your your voice. Yeah. Um, can Can you say that question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like you mentioned initially, you were sort of like trying to emulate Louis C.K. Right. And right. And then, yeah. and then you you then changed to you know talking about surfing or, or being right. tan and 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 whatnot and sort of double down on. On that, so I'm just wondering, like, what what prompted the the switch, and how were you able to find your own like true voice? And the reason I ask this is, yeah. I'm always cu- curious about how creatives from different disciplines operate. Uh, yeah, the same thing comes up in writing too. Like, in writing, you sort of think about emulating your favorite authors, and that eventually you sort of develop your own voice. Um, right. And there are things that can get in the way of that too. And so, I'm just curious how you approach it from a like a stand-up perspective. Yeah, well, um, I think that the, the first thing that happened is I was, I was at the comedy store and I was at an open mic and this guy was judging all the comics. And I went up and I, I was, you know, like six months in and he was like, and I, I made this joke and it, it was more of like a, you know, um, uh, just a joke about myself being in like therapy or whatever. And he was just like, you're just another white guy like uh, you're gonna have to give me a reason to listen to your white humor you know like like mm-hmm. show show me something that i haven't seen before is basically what he was saying but he was a little bit meaner about it uh <laughs> but it did sort of set me on a different course where i'm like i'm like oh yeah maybe i i do need to sort of do something that sets me apart from the pack um and then uh and yeah so then i started thinking about i was like i was like when have i been funny with my family because that's or when have I been funny with my friends and it's like oh when I take on a little bit more of like a an uh I have a little bit more of an ego mm. you know yeah. and sort of and sort of I'm proud of things that I shouldn't be proud of that kind of uh like your tan. approach yeah what's up like your like tan, tan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was talking to my dad I was like when have I been funny it's like when I talk about my hair or my tan or like yeah or when you when you guys talk about how lazy you think I am, but I'm proud of it. You know, how much TV I watch and sort of it was starting from that approach. Right. And sort of working from there and then uh, workshopping it on stage and just, and also some, you talk about like just failing a lot and then sort of learning as I go. Right. Uh, but that was sort of the basis for it. Uh, I guess, does that answer your question? I think. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, totally. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I like that. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah i remember when i first saw it i was like this is different it was like uh, (laughs) and i could see that the audience loved it too Hmm. yeah but yeah it was so nice to see someone being like no the world's a good place and that that was so different in comedy from what uh and then it almost felt like he was satirizing that the world was a good place too so you can do both Hmm. which is kind of interesting by embodying the character he was kind of satirizing the character yeah well that's why i saw jt too because he had a unique really unique approach like this sort of extreme vulnerability but it was sort of like a a positive vulnerability like he was so vulnerable but it was like kind of like a positive coming from like a positive place like it was just something i hadn't seen before so i think it, you know that's sort of i guess why we partnered up because it was sort of he had such a unique perspective on, like a lot of people are vulnerable on stage but he took it to a different place to where mm-hmm. it was like just so much uh it was just he found a way to speak. Yeah. You're only as dark as your secrets. It always feels good to get them off your chest and just, and then no one can really hammer you for anything. Cause they already know they, you got nothing to hide. So I always think of secrets are like 
hiding stuff is like you're putting more armor on your body and it makes you move slower. But mm -hmm. if you give away all your secrets, you can, you can move like the, like Pedro Pascal in Game of Thrones. You're quick. You don't have anything to like slow down your movements. <laughs> I yeah, I like it. I like that. No, I think that's yeah. true. Like there's a lot of truth to that. I think like shame, if you just hold on to it, um, it's heavy. It just, yeah, it's heavy. It gets stronger over time too. Like when you, yeah. I don't know, I, I it used to be of the mindset that if you ignore that stuff, that they just like go away. If you sort of like lock them up in a basement, it just nah. disappears. And I, it doesn't happen. Like they go into the basement, they start downing Red Bulls, they start doing push ups, and then they come yeah. back stronger than ever before. Uh, and then you have to contend with that. And so, yeah, no, letting them out into the light is, is a much better, much better approach. Did you find that with, I've heard scientists are actually pretty healthy through and through because I guess their work helps them understand things. Maybe that's kind of like a general. I don't know. I, you know, I, I think like, just like in any profession, there are healthy scientists and unhealthy scientists and like, and same thing for doctors too. Like there are healthy doctors and then there are unhealthy doctors who don't follow the advice that they shell out to their patients. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. You know, I think even doctors fall prey into like the confirmation bias and, and all of that. And it's so much easier for us to solve other people's problems and to solve our own. <laughs> right. Like, you know, if someone came to me and said, came to me, like, you know, the list of like issues I'm working through, say today, uh, if someone came to me with those issues and said, what should I do? I know exactly what to tell them. Uh, but it's so much harder for me to internalize that advice. Um, it's just how human beings operate. What about with death? I'm really obsessed with death. Are scientists by and large not as afraid of dying? Again, I don't, I don't think I could generalize one way or the other. Um, well, I what think, about you? Yeah, you know, so I used to be uh, really afraid of death. And then honestly, like going back to the psychedelic experience that completely flipped the paradigm. Um, hmm. For for decades, I was convinced that science and spirituality couldn't be reconciled. Like I just had a very materialistic view of the world, not in the monetary sense, but materialistic as in if you can't explain something using the scientific method or if something isn't falsifiable, I just had no interest in it. I was like, mm -hmm. that stuff is like new age, woo woo fluff. Like I don't even want to. I don't care about that. Um, That's kind of where I'm at. Like to me, it's just like the body, the material mind, they're just like, you know, circuits. And then when those things die, kaput. Yeah. So I used to believe that too. and <laughs> I don't anymore. Um, and now like, you know, the, the idea that like consciousness originates in the brain is basically an assumption. So we have nothing proving that. Um, and I think as a result of my psychedelic experiences, it's like I just walked away with a strong sense that like consciousness is not necessarily, and this is just me, right? The very subjective, but consciousness isn't necessarily tethered to the body um, or to the brain for that matter. Um, and so, and that was just a sense I got and that completely flipped my relationship with, with death. Um, so yeah, I used to be afraid of it and I'm still am a little bit, but like not nearly to the same extent as before. Yeah. Did yeah. did you sort of experience that 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 feeling of oneness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around. I just watched, I just read Alan Watts, mm. and he talks about that. And I, I'm I, I'm start I'm trying, especially when I go surfing. I'm like I'm one with the ocean right now, <laughs> but it, it is hard to grasp. Yeah, it really is. I mean, and like, and the experience itself is the, the, like the word people use is ineffable in many ways. Uh, but you do just sense this like profound love mm. uh, in a way that like I just hadn't before and a, just a oneness with, with the universe. Um, you know, the, the book that I would recommend if you are interested in this stuff is Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. Uh, mm. It's just phenomenal. Not only does he dive into the research, but he also recounts his own experiences with with different psychedelics is um is a, is a really really good read but yeah but that experience just completely changed my view on 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 death and on the nature of consciousness in general um yeah i just walked away with a very strong sense that like ah i don't 
there is a lot more to reality than what we're able to see and observe. Uh, mm. And part of it is, is like, I think what you were talking about this JT, it's like the brain shuts down a lot of incoming information to isolate what's going to be the most relevant to us, relevant to our survival, that is. Uh, and then everything else, and Aldous Huxley called this a reducing valve. The, the valve reduces the incoming information. Um, and But when you open the, the doors of perception a little bit and amplify consciousness, then you're able to observe so much more than what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and... And it completely changes you. I mean, I mean that experience was, I would say, like top three most memorable experiences of my life. Wow! Wow. Do you think? Do you think? What? Well, well, I want to know what the other two were, but yeah. then I also want to know. So, do you think dying is necessary? Like, do you think that with AI and stuff that we should look forward to kind of maybe a a much longer life or and maybe a forever life? I don't, I don't know. I think, you know, I, I do think dying serves a purpose. Like it's just a natural cycle of life, but not only that, it's like, you know, people die. And so like they give, they give, they allow room for newer things to emerge. Um, a lot of like the blocks to change in various different fields happen because the people who are entrenched into the, in the status quo are still alive. Mm. Honestly, that's like once they die and then these like new paradigms take hold. Um, mm. And so I do believe in that natural cycle of like you live your life, you die, and then you give way for, for the new to come in. It's like, you know, it's like the snake uh, shedding old skin and the old skin right. has to come off for the new skin to emerge. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think there is there is a lot to be said about that. What was it? I think that was your second question. Was there a first question in there? You said it was a top three. Like, oh, yeah, three. top three. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the, the others would be getting married, definitely. Um, I don't know what the other one would be. I don't know. Let me circle back to that. Getting married or like meeting my wife, basically, because that was like I, I was living in Chicago at the time and I thought I was going to be a bachelor for the rest of my life. And, mm. and then I met her and then like everything changed. Um, and so so that was like complete transformation uh just like the psychedelic experience and if i think of a third one i'll let you know yeah please do yeah cool mm -hmm. nice should we be afraid of ai good question i don't i don't know enough about ai to be able to make uh to be able to give you a good answer on that, honestly. Um, well, like Yuval Harari, he's like, he's like, don't be afraid of it. But then every time he talks about it, I'm like, you're scaring the fuck out of me, dude. Like, this, <laughs> I'm like, this and then, you know, and then there are yeah. smart people on both sides of this camp. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I don't know enough about it to be able to give you, you know, an, an answer that's going to be useful. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. like, please. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm glad please, you asked. Please. It's just, yeah. you know. I, I, I've, uh, I've trained myself to just say, I don't know, uh, instead of trying to. No, I admire it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. If someone asked me, I would weigh in for an hour with no knowledge or information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, do you want to, Chad, do you have any more? Uh, I, have some, I was wondering, um, with space travel, do you see us moving beyond the rocket to, to something like like if we were if in the future we're able to to find other solar to travel to other solar systems mm -hmm. or galaxies it seems like with a rocket it would be very difficult but do you think there's a way do you think we'll find a way basically like a portal to, like in interstellar yeah <laughs> yeah that's what i'm asking no, it's a fire question yeah like yeah. Wor wormholes uh wormholes that's right, right yeah right. wormholes exactly yeah i, I mean and you know Maybe, uh, I, yeah, I think, I don't think the rockets are, and gosh, I mean, rockets are so outdated. <laughs> That's like mm -hmm. one piece of technology that hasn't changed at all, yeah. since the 60s, you know? And so there's a lot of room for, for development there and for new paradigms to, to emerge. And maybe wormholes will be one of those someday, but even in like, even within rockets, man, there's so much room for improvement, uh, mm -hmm. And SpaceX is doing some of that. Like now rockets are becoming reusable, which is right. fantastic. Um, they used to burn up in the atmosphere or plunge into the ocean. Um, 
requiring a new rocket to be rebuilt. I mean, imagine doing the same thing for commercial flights. Like yeah. you fly from, I'm in Portland. You guys are where? Los Angeles, somewhere else? In Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I step off the, people step off the plane and then someone like just comes up and just lights the thing on fire. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds crazy. That's basically what we did for rockets for decades. Uh, and then, but Boeing 737 is actually about the same price as a modern rocket, but airplane flights are so much cheaper because rockets or airplanes can be reused over and over again. And so I think there is still a lot of room for improvement within the existing rockets in terms of making them reusable as quickly and efficiently as possible. And then the other thing that that's interesting is like we have these chemical rockets uh, where you're using fuel, um, chemical fuel basically to to ignite them. But there is now a new generation of rockets that are electric in the sense that they're expelling these ions um, to be able to propel themselves forward. And those, and I write about it a little bit in the book, but those are a lot smaller than traditional rockets. And so there's a lot of promise there in terms of like their capability once something is in orbit. It's just they're not powerful enough to put things into orbit, but once something mm -hmm. is in orbit in terms of maneuvering them and then actually even using ion engines to be able to send things from uh, the the Earth's orbit and say, say to Mars, mm -hmm. uh, that I think is going to be really important going going forward. And who knows, you know, maybe someday I'll be like, interstellar and we'll find some wormholes and be able to travel through them so yeah 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 that'd be yeah. cool um all right do you want to help us answer some questions we typically answer some of our listeners questions and give sure, them yeah. advice on a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a litany of situations um i do i do have to, i have a meeting in like eight minutes that i have to run to we'll pound through these all right sounds good um how do I realize I'm stoked when I'm stoked? What's up, Chad and JT? How do you know that your stoke levels are peaking, aka you're having fun in that moment? And how do you like to take full advantage of that high stoke level? Basically, I'm asking, how do you know you're in the good times before the good times are over? Hmm. You want me to answer that? Yeah, do you want to take it? I've, I've been terrible at this my whole life. Like, I was terrible at finding that <laughs> that being stoked moment and then leaning into it or like finding joy and leaning into it it was always like about like what am i going to accomplish next and what am i going to accomplish next and then you realize like success doesn't bring you happiness and then and then life happens in those really small moments of joy and now i just like when i see it i just try to lean into it whatever it comes up i'm like oh, okay this is joy it's just like strange emotion that's arising in me and i'm gonna hold on to it and 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 squeeze it <laughs> for what it's worth and and just reminding myself that it's like the small moments um like the morning cup of coffee and we just we just got a new puppy and like playing with the puppy um and and like chatting with my wife kathy at night and like it, it's those small moments of for me at least that that bring joy but i need to be very intentional about it just because it like doesn't come naturally to me um mm -hmm. Of, of of leaning into excitement and joy i just when i see it happening it's like i just gotta grab it and then and squeeze the shit out of it basically hell yeah yeah i um i i think uh for me um there are moments where i think it, i think it's from I, actually when i started like thinking about what I'm grateful for, like in the morning, those are the times where I'm like, I'm like, Oh, Oh yeah. Things are really good. And I am stoked. Uh, so I think that that's something I've used, but it is hard to, to really know in the moment where like, this is one of the best times you'll ever have, you know, cause it's hard. Cause you just, in that, in the moment you don't know. And, and I, I do fall victim too, to the sort of like pursuit of success. It's like, I need to keep achieving things, you know? And yeah, and uh so but yeah i think i think it's just the, maybe the key is just when you recognize it to sort of sit back and say like thank you for the stoke <laughs> yeah know. no dude that's that's very uh closely related to a, i there's a kurt vonnegut uh little quote mm -hmm. i like where he said he had a good uncle his late i got it up right now my late uncle alex 
when we were drinking lemonade under an apple tree in the summer, say, and talking lazily about this and that, almost buzzing like honeybees, Uncle Alex would suddenly interrupt the agreeable blather to exclaim, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. Mm. And so I think, you know, his uncle gave him that, and then Kurt V gave that to me. I think if you surround yourself with people who can appreciate the moment, it'll become kind of learned, and, and I think you'll pick up on it. But it is nice to say stuff like that. Like when you're having a good time, just be like, hey, this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I had moments like that in college a lot where I'd look at my buddy Mason, I'd be like, this is awesome. <laughs> like we're, yeah. just ra- we're just raging. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What up, Mace? Um, all right, ex-girlfriend. So recently me and my girlfriend broke up on mutual terms. I talked to one of my buddies and she's telling everyone I have a small dong. Do I confront her about it or do I do something back? I'm not sure. By the way, love the podcast. I'm going to defer to you guys on that question. For sure. Uh, I would say own it. Even if you don't, just be like, yeah, she's right. It's small and I love it. And then she has no more ammo. Yeah, and then look, she loved you despite your small dong. So you sound like a fucking beast. It sounds like an <laughs> yeah. Your attributes are scoring near the top. So I'd be like, yeah, I'm a small dong dude, but that hasn't kept me from, you know, having strong romantic relationships where obviously they're upset at me and they're, they got to talk bad about me afterwards. I had an impact. This little dong had a big impact. And so, and then, you know, after that, you let it go and then you just try and live your best life and, you know, grow your metaphorical dong in any way you can. Yeah. And don't do anything back. Yeah, don't do anything. But what are you going to do? Yeah, that yeah. won't make you happy. No. It's, I think it speaks to her character that she's trashing you. And you got to be like, I don't have to do that because I'm at peace with whatever happened. Yeah. yeah. And I have a small dong. Yeah, and you got a small dong, which is awesome, dude. You know? <laughs> it's like how, didn't they say in like Marie Antoinette's time, like it was cool to be fat because it showed you had like wealth. I think we're coming into a new time period where it's going to be cool to have a smaller penis. You know, they're, they're sleeker. They're more elegant. They're not as garish. You know, yeah. they're, not as, they're not as ostentatious. We're, we're moving back to antiquity. Yeah. We're a s- small penis. Um, uh, and then, I, I, th- oh, go ahead. We, we actually have a good follow-up. Uh, Chad, JT, my dogs, what up? I'm reaching out to you in a time of emotional crisis. My friend Jen exclusively dates guys with small dongs and is really <laughs> embarrassed about it. She doesn't mean to only date dudes with tiny wieners, but it seems like her destiny. <laughs> Could you dude share some advice to help her come to terms with this? She likes no, cool dudes. She's going to have a great life. There's a lot of people to choose from. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry we gave those to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those on. Sometimes we'll, 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 end, we'll, we'll do this one quickly. And this one's, uh, this one's a little more uh, uh, above the waistline. Hey, Chad and JT and any possible guests you might have on. For the past few months during the QT, I've come to the conclusion that I am abusing alcohol. Some days I'll drink easily double-digit drinks. Other days I'll only have a couple. I wake up some mornings and I decide to make a drink to take the edge off. When I don't have a drink, I feel very irritable and not like myself. It's gotten to the point where I'm drinking pretty much every day and it's become a pretty, it's become a very unhealthy lifestyle. What are some ways I can take my mind off the booze when I feel a craving? I think you need professional help. Probably that's going to be the best place to start. It's, um, you know, either a, a, probably a therapist is a, is a good, good, good place to start. But I, I mean, it's really hard to do that sort of thing on your own. Um, especially like if you have a support network and you're living with other people who can, who can help you, um, and keep you accountable. Sure. But it's just, this is, I mean, it's a big burden to carry just by yourself. So I would, I would recommend, getting ideally professional help but if, if you don't have access to that and if you have people who care about you around you starting with them yeah I, I agree yeah dude for sure i think therapy was the best that's what helped me get uh just even understand that i had a sex addiction problem and then um and then going to the meetings they're free and the people there are really really cool and you'll hear some of like the most beautiful truths about human existence that you've ever heard from all these different people that you wouldn't have ordinarily met and you'll make a lot of good friends out of it too. So yeah, I, I, I think you got stuff to be excited for. Get, get in there and, and meet those folks and, and get around some like-minded people who have gone through those issues. Yeah. And then, um, but dude, good on you for identifying it and for emailing in about it. Yeah. 
it's a, it's, you're on the right track. Um, All right, guys. Right, well, I have to. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Dude, guys. Yeah, of course. On. My pleasure. Check out the book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist. It was great talking to you. Yeah, you too, Chad. Uh, yeah, you too, really JT. A pleasure. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thanks, man. All right. Have a great yeah. one. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Guys, thank you for listening to our chat with Ozon Veral. What a legend, dude. Rocket scientist, straight up. Yeah, yeah. smart dude. <laughs> For real. Find smart dude. Yeah. Uh, all right, should we get started with our beef space and legends? Dude, I would love to. Chad, right. why don't you kick it off? My dog, what's your beef of the week? Dude, my beef of the week is updates. Just updates. Uh, Xbox updates. Apple updates. Uh, what else updates? new underwear new shirts you know it's like but mostly just software updates why do they keep me having to update everything just stop like it's fine the way it is i don't need updates it usually screws everything up you know i log into like a game or whatever and the map's all different and i'm like what the fuck just happened they're like oh dude new update i'm like that was so unnecessary i was perfectly happy with things the way they were and then i'll look at my phone and it's like I have like four new apps. I'm like, well, dude, what is going on? They're like, oh, Apple update. You got the update. Nice work. And I'm like, dude, I don't want the update. I like, the, I like it the way it is. Quit fucking with my head. Yeah. Tech companies. They're fiddling too much. Yeah. It's like, they're kind of like, they're like, kind of like, just like, they just went again. They're like, oh wait, we need to, I'm like, dude, just like, leave it. It's fine. I literally had zero complaints. I don't even know what to complain about, but you guys are finding stuff to be like, Oh dude, they probably don't like this. I'm like, no, I liked everything the way it was. So stop. Yeah. Quit tinkering. You know yes. where that, you know where that's supposed to be good is in sports games, Uh huh. but they never do it right. <laughs> yeah. Like updating the rosters and stuff as they get changed throughout the year. Yeah. It, it does bug me with call of duty. Cause then like, They'd be like, hey, they nerfed get this gun. Hey, like quads aren't quads now are different than they used to be. And then you have to like wait a couple weeks for like there to be enough of a backlash for them to change it back. Yeah. And you're like, bro, like you think Leonardo da Vinci kept walking back into the fucking museum and like adding, you know, gave the Mona Lisa bangs? Yeah. But, no, he was done. It, well, yeah, what if he did that and he's just like, oh, dude, check out my update. And everyone's like, oh, dude. Yeah. Why'd you do that? You didn't need to do any updates. And he's like, but I'm, I'm tinkering. I didn't think people were fully satisfied. It's like, dude, leave, you know, leave your work of art as it is. Yeah, for sure. Aaron, who's your beef of the week? My beef of the week is with the 405 freeway. Bro. Generally, there's dozens of reasons to hate the 405. But during the QT, it's not so bad, right? It's like traffic's not terrible. It's great, actually. We we got to San Diego in two hours. Uh, amazing. My beef is with how freaking bumpy this stupid freeway is. Like how I have an SUV, so it's like a truck, you know, so it bounces around a bunch anyway. But the 405 is just insane. It's like so, so not smooth. It's crazy. Mm. Just, uh, it's just like a hazard yeah for sure yeah Dude, it's a terrible freeway it is crazy sometimes you'll be like cruising then you just get some casual air and you're <laughs> yeah. like what dude <laughs> yeah yeah did i just get air in my truck <laughs> uh, exactly and did some some like there'll be some things where i'm like driving and it's like i'll hit like a pothole or something and it's just like <laughs> I'm, like I'm like oh my car man there's nothing I could do, but it just totally destroys your your wheels. Yeah. Like, I didn't sign up for froding, dude. I mean, that's true. Yeah. That's true. My beef of the week is um with someone I know and love, but also hate. It's with myself, dude. Oh, nice. Yeah. I've just, you know, I've been really proud of myself throughout the quarantine for being really precautious. I mean, you know, at times I think I was governed too much by fear, but... uh but I thought overall it was, it was, I was doing a public good and especially cause I was staying with my mom and dad for big stretches of it. So, you know, there was that 
very urgent incentive to keep my parents safe. Um, but since I've been staying at my mom's place alone in Orange County and kicking it with some of my friends that I grew up with, I've just been getting sloppy. And then, you know, the 4th of July, uh, you know, we, we, we shot some stuff. We were out in public. We were wearing masks, but like, then I, I, I don't know. I just have kind of, I think without even realizing I was doing it, I just was getting a bit too loose with it, you know? And then I went down to the beach yesterday and it was busy and I played volleyball against some dudes and, you know, I was rubbing my eyes after touching the ball and stuff. And then I was supposed to hang out with this girl on Thursday who I've been seeing, who's been like my quarantine girlfriend. And now, you know, she doesn't feel great about me coming up and I, I can't argue with her. I'm like, you know, I, I, you know, I could, I could put, she's staying with her parents. I'm like, I could put you y'all at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's tough. It's tough, man. I just got to buckle down. I mean, I, I keep, I want to keep working out with my buddies when they come over. We're outside. I keep my distance, but I don't know. It's tough. I was talking to my doctor friend who I've been hanging out with a lot. And he talked about how in medicine with some drugs, there's a toxicity versus therapeutic uh, threshold where some drugs, they work really well at a, they have a very small uh, window for where they work. Because if you give them a little too much, it'll kill them. But you actually need to give them close to that amount for it to work. And that's how I feel like I am dealing with the quarantine right now. Like I need to push myself to not be Howard Hughes, but I also don't want to get too reckless where I get myself into trouble. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to find that, that balance, you know, between recklessness and actually living my life. And this past weekend, I think I, I tipped too much into recklessness. But hopefully I get out of it without getting the Rona and spreading it to anybody. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I'll learn from it. Oh, and dude, actually, I wanted to read, someone sent us a poem about- About Rona? About Rona. And it, he actually, he was a young fellow who got the Rona. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so he said, long awaited, I, his name is Micah, really sweet guy. Micah, we wish you well, man. You're gonna be all right. He says he's feeling good. You're gonna get through this okay. And we appreciate you being vulnerable and sending us this poem. Long awaited, I chilled, deep inside my abode, spending time inside my dome, breathing clean air and wondering how the world had fared. For many days inside my home, I chilled, waiting for the Rona to lose its scare. But many moons have passed, and there I was, unaware. I thought, let's hit the lake for beers, double backflips, and sweet, sweet fresh air. I, under I underestimated her power and rushed her defeat. I spoke too soon and failed to catch the bullet in my teeth. For now it is unchill and the schmoll is me. A day of freedom was celebrated, but it was the Rona that was set free. Nice. Dude. Uh, yeah. Great. It's a good dude, you know. And uh, yeah, it's hard, but you know, I gotta, I gotta live it like I preach it, bro. Mm -hmm. I gotta mask up. I gotta stay safe, and you know, not not be in big groups. But those are the big ones. Uh, For sure. And you know. And just keep loving virtually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough when, like, you know, because people will ask you to hang out, and it's and it's like you, I feel like you have a, you know, it's like when you get tortured. You know, everyone has their breaking point, and it's like, how many times do you say no to your squad? Um, which, totally. I've been saying. I mean. I, I saw you, but like I've been saying no pretty much to to most people, but it's like it, it it's I don't know. Yeah, that's what happened to me yesterday. Yeah, you, you can you can get too too like um it's such like a collective thing, like when there's like too many people like that are not being sick or let that are just hanging out, you know, and it's like then you just like in your mind you'll be like oh it's okay you know it's so easy to fall into that trap i think because everyone else is doing it and then fomo kicks in um but then like like I, i've had times i hung out with some college friends like three weeks ago and i got pretty hammered and i woke up like i, I kind of blacked out and i was like the next day i was like oh that wasn't too bad and i woke up the day after that i was like oh fuck dude yeah <laughs> like, i was not safe at all and luckily I was fine, uh, but it is like a, it is, it's tough. It's little things too, dude. Like you'll just catch your, you know, cause you, you, you let down your guard a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you know, I grabbed a cigarette from Lucchese 
you know, occasionally yeah. like once every six months, I'll smoke a cigarette. And, you know, I grab it out of his pack. And then the next day I'm like, ah, but if he had something like that's not safe going into someone's, you know, if you want a cigarette, you got to get your own pack, bro. That's just the reality of it right now. Yeah. And, and then yesterday I went for a jog with my buddy, Tom on the beach. We ran to this busy part of the beach. And then all of a sudden he gets a hair up his ass and he's like, oh dude, let's play volleyball. And next thing I know I'm on the court and I'm like, dude, I don't want to do this. And he's like, all right, hey. And I'm like, let's just have us two on this court. We'll, we'll play twos against two other guys. And then they're like, hey, do you guys want to play threes? And Tom's like, yeah, let's play threes. And then all of a sudden there's another guy on my side coming yeah. over to slap my hand and talk strategy. He's like a 65 year old, like army vet. And I'm like, dude, can you back up, bro? And he's yeah. looking at me like, what? And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. Like I'll pass to you as well as I can, but I don't want to be close to you. And it's just, yeah. I don't know. and now I, now I have a lot of, you know, ambivalence about it i mean I'm, I, it felt good yesterday because it distracted me because literally i was scared from fourth of july so i needed to get my brain off putting myself out there too much and the way i did that was by putting myself out there again it was like yeah. I, I took more of the it's like taking a chocolate laxative to fix your constipation yeah i stole that from slavo zizek that blubbering fool of a philosopher with the annoying lisp <laughs> Um, Chad, who's your babe of the week? Dude, my babe of the week is my forearm tan. You know, last time I did my ankle tan. And, dude, my forearms are looking fresh, dude. I'm going to lie, like, pretty golden, you know. Like, I've been wearing a short sleeve wetsuit, so I've been getting those forearms nice and golden. You know, they look – my forearms look like tater tots. <laughs> I'm just pumped. So yeah, shout out to my forearm tan for being a babe. Dude, that's a beautiful comp with the tater tots. Dude, thank you. Aaron, who's your babe of the week? My babe of the week is the ice cream flavor rainbow sherbet. Oh yeah, dude. And it's sherbet, not sherbet. We all it's a common mistake. Are you sure about that? I'm absolutely certain. I'm right. I'm I'm sure about it. Sure about it. <laughs> Dude, I just bowed to you after that, after that pun. I just hit you with a karate bow. Yeah. It's probably, it's probably some sort of Mandela effect thing, but uh, yeah, it's just great in the summer. It's like the best thing you can have. It's nice, uh, nice little sweet sour treat. Uh, I go with the rainbow cause you can never, I find if you buy at the store, you can never, you can never quite, uh, be sure about single flavors. Like sometimes you buy just the orange and it just sucks for whatever reason. So I go with the, the rainbow. It's usually like a, a lime green and like a, a strawberry and an orange. Just just great. And it's the, it's the best thing, I think, at Baskin Robbins of the 31. So uh, shout out to Rainbow Sherbet. Hell yeah, dude. Nice. It needed to be said. I love Rainbow Sherbet, dude. On uh, on Friday or or Thursday, I uh, I just bought a whole thing of Briar's mint chip. It was a quart. I ate it all while we were playing Call of Duty. I know. I I, I was getting updates on it. That was a solid update. That was yeah. an update I wanted. Was chat yeah. how far are you along on that Briar's mint chip, dude? Yeah, dude. Ice cream updates are legit. Yeah. <laughs> Who's um, your babe? My baby of the week is uh, gamblers. So gamblers don't have sports right now. But I picked this little tidbit of information up from Tyler Cowen on his podcast. Gamblers are betting on shark migration patterns right now. They want wow. the juice so bad that they found something worth betting on. And what they found was shark migration patterns. I don't know who's betting the over, who's betting the under, who's betting the Indian Ocean, who's betting the Atlantic Ocean. I just love that they're putting action on it. Dude. You know what I mean? That's awesome. I, I just pictured two, like, you know, hustler guys in Vegas, and they're like, I'll give you two to one. I'll give you two to one that the Mako makes it to Cabo by the end of, by the end of July. And he's like, two to one? Are you out of your fucking mind? And he's, like, studying it up on the, you know. These guys are learning about shark migration patterns so they can bet on it. They're bettering themselves while putting their house on the line, some of them. No, nah, they're <laughs> good. They're winning houses. These guys are killers. Dude, I, I love that. And, and you know that those aren't rigged because the sharks can't be swayed by, like, by money or influence unless you know the scientists are putting weird trackers on them dude that's a fire call or they get they pay a guy in like a fishing boat to just chum put yeah. chum in the ocean and lead it like a like a breadcrumb trail all the yeah. way up to alaska yeah yeah 
Dude, I, I would love to bet on sharks. They pay one of the sharks off with a fat satchel of tuna? Yeah. He's like, dude, just why don't you go north for this one? And he's like, it's like, dude, but my whole squad is going south. We're all going to Cabo. He's like, just go to Alaska. He's like, dude, I got a bag of yellowfin with your name on it if you go up to Alaska. It's, like, <laughs> it's too rich a deal to resist. I got to do it. Yeah, dude. Um, so, yeah, big ups to the gamblers for making it happen. We're um, actually at ATC. We're, we're uh, partnered with a, a sports gambling podcast. <laughs> That's literally the title of it. And they're on, the on our YouTube channel. Uh, they're doing, sorry, my dog's barking, but uh, they're doing um, like Madden simulated games, betting on that. <laughs> like from Crazy. like recreating the playoffs of last year and, and letting the simulator run it. And they commentate and call it live. Like it's really happening. It's crazy. Interesting. And it's all AI. There's no human element to it. Yeah. All AI. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody I playing. Would- I wouldn't trust a comp on that, dude. Well, it's all happening live, so that's no one's. Hopefully, no one's manipulating it. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. You never know, dude. <laughs> Somebody does. Same person who knows what Epstein was up to. I might be coming around on Epstein. Not that I think he's cool now. I never thought he was cool. Yeah. <laughs> he did, he did. You know, you might want to re-record that because that <laughs> yeah. soundbite is pretty bad. I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't mean it like that at all. I meant that I wasn't as uh, engrossed or, or interested in, in the vastness of the conspiracy around him or the vastness of his network of fellow perverts. And now I'm starting to be like, no, maybe I should be more interested in it. Yeah, the the... the- the documentary is pretty, pretty good. I, I got interested because in our buddy Luke Casey was, he turned on a podcast talking about it. And I was like, and I love conspiracies. And I was like, Ooh, this is getting my juices flowing. And so, and this one's also like, you know, there's a lot of like, it is a real conspiracy. Like people, you know, th- this one's right. for real. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's a terrible story. I can feel that you want to say something. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, dude. There's a lot of powerful people who are, you know, up to some shenanigans and, and they protected him. And now Ghislaine Maxwell is in the slammer and she's probably going to talk. 2020. Like I can't even picture 2020 getting any bigger, but this will make it bigger. Yeah. Yeah. This is taking it next level. Yeah. Just when you thought 2020 couldn't have any more twists and turns, we're about to find out every rich person who's a molester. <laughs> Dad, I was going to say every rich person is a molester. I'm like, dude, it seems to be that yeah, way. That might be it too. It's like, I'm like, God damn, dude. Um, all right, Chad, who's your legend of the week? Uh, my legend of the week is your mom's house. Dude, fire. Thank you, man. Dude. I I woke up at your mom's house and I was like, I'm in like Mexico right now. Like San Clemente, you got the pool, you got the view, you know, you're just looking out over like the hills and you see the ocean and there's just sun coming in and there's grass and there's kettlebells where you can just shred your quads, blow up your traps, you know, just tone up your delts. And it's just like, I was like, smiling from ear to ear i was like dude i'm so stoked right now thank you monica uh it's just a it's just it's paradise dude thank you i'm gonna play this clip for my mom she's gonna be so thrilled to hear you say that i mean i think that's one of the things that my mom takes a huge amount of pride in and i think she succeeds in it so well is that like she loves having a house that people love to come to like the house i grew up in as a kid we had Every time I came home, there was 10 people over. Like, my mom loves to host and entertain. Yeah. And so, for you to say that, man, that really means a lot. Thank oh, you. dude, thank you, man. Yeah, I was driving out with Lucchese. I was like, dude, I need a house like that. <laughs> That's why I'm living here, dude. <laughs> it's so awesome. Yeah, yeah it is nice, dude. <laughs> and it's not like, it's not, and it's not awesome in the sense that it's like, kind of like, it's like, you know, kind of like. Garish or ostentatious or something. Exa- exactly, yeah. It's, a, it's like, you know it's just like a nice feeling there's a lot of thought put into it right yeah and and the backyard is just i mean they talk about nirvana 
Yeah, we were watching. We watched. She's got a TV outside. We watched Gladiator and Rounders on Fourth of July. Yeah. Gladiator to get you fired up, and then Rounders just a nice movie to settle into. Yeah. It's good times. And then our buddy got sick, started boking that night, Dude, and I was yeah. convinced he had the Rona. And I was like, oh, fuck, we're fucked. Yep, we got too close to the sun. I've been texting him every day. How you feeling today? He's like, I'm good, dude. Just I think I had some bad hot dogs. I'm yeah. like, all right, well, keep me posted, baby. Yeah, dude, you're freaking him out because you're like, you're like, comes down, he's like, oh, oh. And you're like, what's going on, dude? What other symptoms do you have? And he's like, dude, I think I was just puking. Like, I feel fine. And you're like, stay away from me. <laughs> I know. I felt like such a scumbag. Luke Casey's like, is, is, is Chigas okay? I was like, I didn't even ask him if he was okay. I just made sure he was staying away from me. <laughs> like I went up, I was like, do you have coronavirus? He's like, I don't think so. I was like, stay away from me, bro. And then I walked downstairs and I was like, I probably could have been nicer about that. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't that bad, but I was, no, was no. subtext. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for saying all that nice stuff about my mom's crib though. Oh yeah, of course. Aaron, who's your legend of the week? My legend of the week, ironically, is my mom. Nice, oh, dude. Nice. Yeah. I hadn't seen her since uh, about Christmas time, and, and I was staying away because of, you know, COVID, and she's immunocompromised. She's, she's beaten cancer a couple different times. Hmm. So, um, but then I got tested, and I wasn't around anybody after that, anybody from outside our house. So, we drove down, and... and spent some time and that was good and just a nice little recharge um you know just being around being around my mom it's awesome that's awesome dude i'm I'm gonna have to dap you up then as a legend of the week too for just keeping it safe and and setting the tone for 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 you know because i'm sure you felt squarely at times but you've you've managed to be safe and consistent so big ups yeah 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 it's tough you you want to be I mean, I'm kind of fine being inside. I don't mind, <laughs> but but when you do go out, you want to be safe. Yeah. My my other legend of the week is uh is just working out with your bros. Um, I think it's you know you got to be careful about it now. Uh, but I've I've managed to get some lifts in with some of my dogs, and it's uh it might be the most soul nourishing thing in the universe. Uh. And and it pushes you always to work out harder. When you see your dogs firing it out, you just you can't even help it. The testosterone gets going, and you're like, you know what? I'm doing extra sets. I'm doing more work than I thought I was going to do today. And then pretty soon you're doing, you know, pistol squats, and you're you're hitting some upside down push ups, and you're you're that tweak in your neck. You're really thinking about it. Like, is it ever really going to go away, or should I just push through it? And you know, you got to listen to your body. You know that toxicity um, therapeutic threshold. But sometimes you got to push it. You got to push it a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's the best. I just love jack dudes. I love seeing buff dudes move their bodies. It's, it's glorious. And the fact that some of my friends have kept it tight, you know, when a lot of people are letting it slide, I just, I fucking admire the fuck out of it. You know, Farrar today was doing handstand walks. He's walking on his hands upside down. The guy's like 210. Farrar, I hope you hear this. So I want you to know when I was watching you, I was happier than I've ever been in a long time. It made me really happy. Um, yeah, so fellas, you know, stay hot. Dude, yeah, I mean, you got some hot dudes in that squad, and I love watching those stories. Like, I watch them over, and I'm like, dude, Ferraro's pecs, dude? Freaking. Yeah wash your dishes on those or what do you what do you do on nice pecs you just i think they call them dinner plate pecs you know what i wanted to do when i saw his pecs i wanted to skate his pecs yeah like a half pipe yeah you got that new board too yeah he's got like a half pipe you know there's so much mass that the like crevice would make a nice half pipe so ferraro if you're listening i want to skate your pecs yeah thank you ferraro it was tough being friends with that many hot dudes. It was like challenging. You had to like accept things about yourself, but it made me better. Yeah. Give me something to strive for. Now, if I see a hot dude, I just get jacked up. I'm like, I know that guy's cool. <laughs> Chad. Well, I mean, that's also why you, Chad, you're a very hot guy. Oh, Aaron, dude. You're a very hot guy. 
I don't think I have Ferraro standards, but thank you. Yeah, I'm not hot doing guy. I'm No, hey. Hand walking. There's all kinds of different hot guys. You guys are hot guys. All right, I don't hang out with non-hot guys. Oh, thanks, My friend John Daniels used to be like, he'd be like, dude, you're gay. You only hang out with hot guys. I was like, I don't do it intentionally. It works out that way. I'd be like complaining to him about life. I'd be like, dude, I feel all mixed up. And like, I don't know, really know what I'm doing. And like, I don't know, I kind of feel repressed. And he'd just go, dude, you're gay. And I was like, dude, I'm not gay. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, but I was like, I'm not gay. He's like, dude, you're gay. You're only friends with the hot guys. I was like, all right, man, I don't think you're getting it, but I appreciate your perspective. Um, he's a really hot guy too. He's so hot. Yeah, he's a hot dude. Um, all right, Chad, what's your quote of the week? Uh, my quote of the week is from, dude, I was reading some stoicism this morning. I got fired up. Nice, dude. This is from my dog, Epictetus. What up, Ep- Ep- Epictetus? If you wish to improve, be content to, uh, let me start that again. If you wish to improve, be content to appear clueless or stupid in extraneous matters. Don't wish to seem knowledgeable. And if some regard you as important, distrust yourself. And it's a good quote for like the times now when there's so much media to consume. Like the guy explained it and he's like, he's like, oftentimes, you know, we, we always want to seem like up to date on what's going on in the news, like all the cool TV shows, like just, to know everything about what's going on so we don't seem silly at dinner parties for example and he's like but i challenge you to just say straight up i don't care because how much you know if you if you don't if you take all that effort into like consuming all the media that's like all the news that's going on and just getting upset over all the news that's going on upset over like you know, potential crises that probably won't ever happen. How much more time and energy could you use for things that are actually like ta- tangible and relevant to your life and improving on them? That's sort of what it's about. I mean, I, do, I definitely feel like how people will mistake information for understanding. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm guilty of that too. Like, oh, if I can name enough things and reference enough things, like people will think I'm smart, but that's not really what intelligence is, right? intelligence is like is something danker than that no yeah no i yeah i, I think a lot of it what i got is like to to you know it, it's so easy for like the news to like upset us we're like you know like i guess 2020 is the end of the world like and just to be upset about it and it's like you know i don't know i kind of feel like there's always something to be upset about but you can't, dude, control, think, you can't control it. You can't control your own life, though, and what you do and how you respond to things. Or if you have a Klondike bar, maybe it's also the 2020 is making me appreciate shit more. You know what yeah. I mean? Like maybe lifting with my dogs wouldn't have been as impactful if there wasn't the stakes that we're surrounded by. Right. You know I mean? The right. urgency we're surrounded by. Like now when I eat a Klondike bar, I'm like, how fucking special is a Klondike bar? Yeah. You know? But eight months ago, you know, it wouldn't have tasted the same. Or like, hooking totally. up with, dude, when you hook up with a girl or a woman or, 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 or a guy or whoever you hook up with or a child, if you're Jeffrey Epstein, you know? Oh, I don't need to say that. That's stupid. Sorry, I was trying to be inclusive. Um, <laughs> but when you hook up with someone, you're saying, I trust you. You know, I trust yeah. you enough. I trust that you're safe. I trust that you're living your life in a certain way that you're going to keep me safe. Or you're the other way. You're saying, hey, I don't give a shit. And I know you don't give a shit. We're both wild. It's, it's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Dude, yeah. I, uh, I think boning now is sort of like Jude Law boning in behind or enemy at the gates. Yeah. Remember that scene? Yeah. Oh, oh do I remember? Uh, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. I remember that scene. But like, dude, that was some boning. That was a hot scene. Dude, yeah. I think it was just like his bare ass too, just like going up and down, but yeah, I still, still thought it was pretty hot. Well, it was like, you know, they're stuck in the barracks. They're surrounded by like, you know, the soldiers are all living pretty rough lives. Everyone's pretty dirty and stuff. And then they're like, yeah. you know what? I'm, I'm too horny not to do this right now. We got to get yeah. it on. Yeah. yeah. That in the eight mile sex scene. Oh, oh, dude. Yes. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, rest in peace, B Murphs. Um, yeah, yeah, those are those are good ones. Yeah, those times where you just got it, where, where you're like, 
you know, I don't even care what's going on around me. I got to lay it down. Yeah. Alive with the power of love. Alive with the glory of love. That's the song I like. About that. Yeah. It's about that. About that. That boning when the world's burning. Yeah. Aaron, what's your quote of the week? Well, aside from JT a few minutes ago saying, I love Jack Dudes. <laughs> uh, we lost another legend this week. Uh, Carl Reiner mm. uh, passed away at 98, lived a great life, long life, gave birth to Rob, who's an amazing director, uh, and worked with Mel Brooks for fucking decades and uh, just amazing. Uh, the Jerk is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yes. Um, and so I could I could pick a million quotes from the jerk. He didn't Carl didn't write it, but he directed it, and so I'm sure he had a lot of input on set about all these different bits and how they're how they're uh, how they played out on scene um, on camera. And uh, I just found a scene. Uh, it's when it's when Steve Martin as Navin and uh, Bernadette Peters uh, as uh, Marie are on their first date and it's clearly it's gone really well and they're just hanging out back at uh naven's place and he says uh naven says can i ask you a personal question marie says what is it uh i didn't she said it much better than i did uh now to be totally honest you do have a boyfriend don't you and she says kind of he says i know this is our first date but do you think the next time you make love to your boyfriend you could think of me (laughs) <laughs> and she says, well, I haven't made love to him yet. And Naven says, that's too bad. Do you think it's impossible? Do you think it's possible that someday you could make love with me and think of him? <laughs> and she goes, who knows? Maybe you and he could make love and you could think of me. And Naven says to end the scene, uh, I'd just be happy to be in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's just beautiful absurd nonsense yeah uh that i love about that movie so much yeah the so stacking good. of it is so good yeah. yeah that's killer yeah and there's a million of those in, the, in that movie the quotes are endless so r.i.p carl reiner definitely uh my quote of the week is from the uh, band one direction uh the now disbanded band wonder direction they've all gone their separate ways you know they're most of them are having pretty uh, uh, successful solo careers, but I think they were kind of at their best when they were together. And it's from their song, Drag Me Down, which was after Zayn had already left the group. But I really relate to the lyrics of this song. Um, I've got fire for a heart. I'm not scared of the dark. Uh, just a little side note. That, that's one of the lines that really connects to me. I'm not scared of the dark because I, mean, I am scared of the dark. So it's important to me to not be, to fight it. You've never seen it look so easy. I got a river for a soul, and baby, you're a boat. Baby, you're my only reason. If I didn't have you, there would be nothing left. The shell of a man that could never be his best. If I didn't have you, I'd never see the sun. You taught me how to be someone. Is that it? Uh, I'll keep going. Uh, Well, you had a face like you were going to keep going. I couldn't make up my mind. Dude, you're very intuitive. I was like, do I do the chorus or do I leave it there? How's it more powerful? I think it needs the chorus. It needs the chorus. All my life, you stood by me when no one else was ever behind me. All these lights, they can't blind me. With your love, nobody can drag me down. It's a good song, dude. Uh, I got to listen to that. I've never heard One Direction. Dude, there's a moment in the music video where Harry Styles is walking down the tarmac of like, a air, uh, of like an airport and like – his charisma and his star power it's like a two second shot i think it's at a minute 12 where he's just stomping down the runway and you're like dude that is a fucking star really megawatt yeah just a jizz banger um chad what's your phrase of the week for getting after it my phrase of the week for getting after it is like is um
I'm going to take off my pants. Nice, dude. I like how you thought about it a lot. Yeah, I was trying to be profound. Well, profundity is where you live, bro. Thanks. Aaron, do you want to join Chad in profundity? Uh, I think I'm going to go a slightly different route and just do another quote from the jerk. Uh, nice. It's just, uh, I have a special purpose. <laughs> Which in the movie is is what his mom uh, called his dick. <laughs> <laughs> I love the scene where he, he writes the letter. He's like, he's like, I'm getting lots of work. Next week, Patty says she's gonna give me a blowjob. <laughs> um, my phrase of the week for getting after it is from Joe List from uh, the Tuesdays with Stories podcast. Him and Mark Norman do it together. They're both tremendous stand-up comics and, and some of the quickest banterers around. Um, and it, Mark Norman was quoting Joe List saying it, but he said, uh, reason is edgy now. And I thought that was a good summarization of where we're at. It does feel like that sometimes. You're like, wait, people aren't allowed to say this or, or people are disagreeing with this and mm-hmm. like getting pissed off about it. You're like, really? And it just feels like, yeah, like sometimes reason can be edgy now. And yeah, so good call, Joe. Yeah. Mr. List, who's That's actually kind of shredded too. And Norman is, is super he? shredded. Yeah. I saw a shirtless photo of the both of them. I'm like, Joe List has a six pack. It's so funny too, because on their podcast, they're like, we're a couple of, you know, they talk in that kind of like uh, old timey banter. And they're like, we're a couple yeah. of, you know, knobs with no muscle who don't know how to use our dicks. And then you look at them and you're like, uh, I've seen Joe List in person. He's kind of a stud. He's like six two or something. Really? Yeah. I'm like, dude, move out of the nerd block where you pretending like you, you know. We're like, like that's your community, dude. We all know you're, you know, you belong in John Elway Street. Yeah, dude, too many pretend nerds in the comedy community. I do it sometimes, too. I don't know what it is. There's something like, in, you think if you do comedy, you got to be, you, you got to be, I understand why you need to be self-deprecating, but sometimes it does feel disingenuous. Like Judd Apatow, he's supposed to be an animal. I heard when that guy's like fighting on set or fighting with producers and stuff, he's like Alec Baldwin and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. But then you see him do stand up and he's like, oh. I peed my pants in front of my daughter and she threw pudding in my face. Yeah. You're like, you really? I took my daughters to a Taylor Swift concert and they called me a nerd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then they punched me in the balls. Yeah. Fuck off, Judd Apatow. <laughs> that feels nice i don't know why that feels so nice yeah. uh, I, I hear you yeah something cathartic about it it's always uh, good to orient if you have discomfort oriented around someone you're upset at you know who's out of your world you know yeah who, who guys said it to She's like, man, everything sucks. I don't know what to do with anything. The world's fucking burning. You should be, you know what? Fuck this one person. And then you'll mm-hmm. feel better. Yeah, yeah. I know that's not stoke inducing, but it's, a, it'll, it'll, it's like a shot of stoke that'll get you to the more higher purpose stoke down the road. Totally. Yeah. I don't know, dudes. All right. Is that, do we bang it out? Yeah, I think that's the pot.